our Earth is home to countless plant and animal species, all of which have a limited lifespan and are bound to die. Yet these species have existed for several thousands of years. That's because living organisms can reproduce. That is, they give rise to offspring, which in turn grow and reproduce their own offspring of the same kind. This ensures survival of the species generation after generation. In living organisms, we see two types of reproduction, sexual and asexual. In sexual reproduction, a gamete from the male parent fuses with a gamete from the female parent to form a zygote. However, in asexual reproduction, the organism or the parent cell divides to give rise to morphologically and genetically identical organisms called clones. Asexual reproduction, commonly seen in protists, moniruns and fungi, is of many different types. The amoeba, for instance, reproduces by binary fission, where the parent cell divides into two halves and each half develops into a daughter cell. Likewise, bacteria too reproduce through binary fission. Yeast, on the other hand, reproduces through budding, where the parent cell produces small buds through mitosis. These buds initially remain attached to the parent cell and then separate to develop into new organisms. While yeast reproduces through budding, other members of the fungi kingdom, such as penicillium, reproduce through conida, a special asexual reproductive structure. Apart from fungi, we also see asexual reproductive structures in certain members of kingdom animalia. In the case of hydra, buds which develop on the parent body serve as a means of reproduction. Likewise, the sponge produces internal buds called gamules that aid in asexual reproduction. Apart from single-celled organisms and animals, asexual reproduction is also seen in simple plants such as algae as well as in certain higher plants such as potato. For instance, Chlamydomonas, a type of algae, develops zoospores which later mature into new plants. However, during unfavorable conditions, Chlamydomonas, as well as other types of fungi and algae, undergo sexual reproduction. In higher plants, asexual reproduction, commonly known as vegetative propagation, takes place through vegetative propagules, specialized structures which emerge from different parts of the plant. For instance, the stem of a potato plant is dotted with buds known as eyes, which later germinate into new plants. Whereas in a ginger plant, modified stems or rhizomes having nodes and buds act as a means of vegetative propagation. While the buds develop into a new ginger plant, the nodes of the rhizome give way to adventitious roots which help in the absorption of water and minerals from the soil. Bryophyllum, on the other hand, have notches on the margin of their leaves that give rise to adventitious buds that fall off and later germinate into new plantlets. Apart from buds and nodes, runners, suckers, offsets and bulbs are other examples of vegetative propagules in plants. Interestingly, farmers and gardeners make full use of vegetative propagation for commercial cultivation of various plants including strawberry, potatoes and ginger. Vegetative propagation, however, can turn into a problem in certain cases like the fishermen of Bengal have discovered. 
water hyacinth, an aquatic plant with a phenomenal rate of vegetative propagation, is choking the Bay of Bengal and killing millions of fish, thereby ruining the livelihood of the fishing community. Asexual reproduction, an important biological process that ensures continuity of life, occurs differently in different organisms. Reproduction, an important biological process occurring in living organisms, ensures continuity of life. Organisms reproduce either asexually or sexually. In the case of sexual reproduction, we see the fusion of male and female gametes which are either produced by the same individual or by different individuals of the opposite sex. Though organisms which engage in sexual reproduction vary in their external and internal structure, the pattern of sexual reproduction remains quite similar. All organisms, for instance, go through three phases of life the juvenile phase reproductive phase and senescence phase the juvenile phase is a period of growth which is characterized by an increase in height in all animals including human beings whereas in plants we see the emergence of new leaves during the juvenile phase did you know that in plants, the juvenile phase is known as the vegetative phase? Interestingly, the duration of the juvenile or vegetative phase varies in different organisms. In human beings, for instance, the juvenile phase lasts for 13 to 16 years in the case of females and 13 to 15 years in males. Whereas a mango tree remains in the vegetative phase for around three to five years. The juvenile phase is succeeded by the reproductive phase in both plants and animals. In the case of plants, this phase is marked by the appearance of flowers or vegetative propagules such as runners. However, while some plants, such as the rose, flower throughout their lifespan, others, such as the mango, flower seasonally. Interestingly, in the case of mango, which also happens to be a perennial plant, it is very difficult to define the various phases of life. That's because perennials which have a long reproductive phase, keep shedding their leaves throughout the year or once a year in winter. The shedding of leaves can be misinterpreted as a sign of the senescent phase. However, it is easy to identify the phases in the case of annuals and biennials. As all three phases of an annual plant occur in one year, Whereas, biennials have a two-year life cycle in which the plants enter the vegetative phase in the first year and the reproductive followed by the senescent phase in the second year. Did you know that certain plants such as bamboo flower only once in a hundred years, produce fruits and then die? Similarly, strobilanthus Kuntiana or Nila Kuranji flowers every 12 years? Just as plants develop specialized structures during the reproductive phase, animals too show certain morphological and physiological changes. In human beings, for example, the reproductive phase, which starts with puberty, leads to the development of male and female secondary sexual characters such as facial hair in male and breasts which are seen more prominently in females. 
Moreover, females of all placental mammals, including primates and non-primates, demonstrate cyclical changes in the activities of their ovaries and accessory ducts, as well as hormones during the reproductive phase. Known as the menstrual cycle in primates and the estrus cycle in non-primates, these cycles stop once the female becomes pregnant and resume after the female has given birth to offspring. Moreover, placental mammals, especially those living in the wild, exhibit these cyclical changes as well as breed only during favorable seasons. These mammals are therefore called seasonal breeders. Sheep, for instance, have spring as their favorable season for breeding. Breeding during spring allows for the birth of lambs at an optimal time. That is, when the weather is warm and there is plenty of grass and water available in nature. In human beings, on the other hand, the females experience the menstrual cycle and are active throughout their reproductive phase. They are therefore called continuous breeders. The end of the reproductive phase in living organisms coincides with the beginning of the senescent phase during which we see changes such as senility, non-existence of the menstrual or estrus cycle, and slowing of metabolism. Senescence ultimately leads to death. Interestingly, the transition between the three stages is controlled by hormones as well as environmental factors. For instance, the release of the hormone estrogen triggers the menstrual cycle in girls. Moreover, girls living in tropical regions experience menstruation at an earlier age than those living in temperate regions. In most organisms, the reproductive phase plays a crucial role as it ensures continuity of life. The birth of an offspring is perhaps one of the most important and joyous events in the life of a sexually reproducing organism. This event, however, is a culmination of events such as the development of the zygote and embryogenesis. Both these events, incidentally, are the mainstay of post-fertilization the third stage in sexual reproduction. Did you know that every sexually reproducing organism begins his or her life as a zygote? Depending on whether fertilization is internal or external, the zygote is either formed inside the organism or outside in an external medium such as water. After its formation, the development of the zygote is largely influenced by its environment. After its formation, the development of the zygote is largely influenced by its environment. Take the case of organisms such as fungi and algae, whose zygotes are formed either in water, rocks or soil. These zygotes develop thick walls that are resistant to desiccation as well as environmental damage. However, an unfavorable environment forces the zygote to undergo a period of rest and start storing nutrients before germinating. The environment also influences the germination of the zygote. Apart from the environment, the development of the zygote is also influenced by the life cycle of an organism. If the organism has a haplontic life cycle, as in the case with Chlamydomonas, 
you will notice that the zygote divides meiotically and forms haploid spores. However, in the case of a fern, a pteridophyte with a haplodiplontic life cycle, the zygote divides mitotically to form a sporophyte. After the initial development, the zygote slowly starts metamorphosing into an embryo through a process known as embryogenesis. During this process, the zygote starts to divide mitotically, which results in an increase in the number of cells. Simultaneously, the zygote also undergoes cell differentiation, a process during which groups of cells go through modification to form different tissues and organs. For example, the cells of an embryo differentiate to form nervous tissue, which later develops into organs such as the brain or spinal cord. Embryogenesis, which occurs in almost all animals, can take place inside or outside the body of the female. In oviparous or egg-laying animals, such as reptiles and birds, the process of embryogenesis takes place outside the body of the female, that is, in eggs laid by these animals. The eggs, covered by a hard calcareous shell, are usually laid in a sheltered place such as pens and treetops to keep them safe from the prying eyes of predators. Once the incubation period is over, the young ones hatch from these eggs. In the case of viviparous animals such as mammals, the process of embryogenesis occurs inside the body of the female. The embryo derives all its nourishment from its mother and begins to develop into a young one. After attaining a certain stage of growth, the young one is ready to emerge from the body of the female. Did you know that the young ones of viviparous animals have a better chance of survival than the young ones of oviparous animals as the body of a female offers better nutrition and protection than an eggshell? Apart from animals, the development of the zygote and embryogenesis occur in flowering plants as well. Interestingly, the formation and subsequent development of the zygote inside the ovule triggers the withering of other parts of the flower including the sepals, petals and stamens. The pistil, which contains the ovule, however, remains attached to the plant. During embryogenesis, the zygote develops into the embryo whereas ovules develop into seeds. The ovary, on the other hand, develops into a fruit. The fruit is covered with pericarp, a thick wall that protects the seeds and the embryo. After the fruit is consumed, the seeds get dispersed by wind, water or animals. These seeds later germinate into a new plant. Thus, in both plants and animals, the formation of a new life hinges on the development of a zygote and embryogenesis, the two post-fertilization events. Sexual reproduction, which is common in higher plants and animals, is a far more complicated and elaborate process 
than asexual reproduction. This form of reproduction essentially involves the fusion of male and female gametes. Produced by reproductive structures such as the strobili, stamen and pistil in the case of plants and testes and ovaries in animals. Interestingly, while some organisms are endowed with both male and female reproductive structures, others possess only one of either reproductive structure. For instance, gymnosperms such as pinus possess both male and female strobili and are called bisexual or monoecious plants. Cycas, on the other hand, has the male and female strobili growing on different trees and is known as a dioecious or unisexual plant. Angiosperms too comprise a variety of monoecious and dioecious plants. For instance, the coconut tree is considered a monoecious plant where a single tree bears the staminate, the stamen bearing unisexual male flower, and the pistillate, the female flower bearing the pistils. Even the pea plant is a monoecious plant as both the stamen and pistil are present on the same flower. Papaya, on the contrary, is a dioecious plant that bears staminate and pistillate flowers on different trees. Did you know that we come across bisexual and unisexual organisms even in fungi? Bisexual fungi such as the straw mushroom bear the male and female gamete angium the plus and the minus mating type on the same thallus. Hence, these types of fungi are also known as homothallic. This is in contrast to heterothallic fungi such as rhizopus, which bears the male and female gamete angium, that is, the plus and minus mating type on different thallus. Apart from fungi, we also see unisexual and bisexual organisms in the animal kingdom. The earthworm, which has both testis and ovary, is bisexual in nature. Did you know that bisexual animals are also called hermaphrodites? Human beings, on the other hand, are unisexual organisms as each individual possesses either the male or female reproductive organ. Regardless of whether organisms are unisexual or bisexual, reproductive structures play an important role in sexual reproduction. A process that's divided into three distinct stages, namely the pre-fertilization, fertilization and post-fertilization stage. The pre-fertilization stage is the first stage in sexual reproduction and includes gametogenesis and gamete transfer, events that occur prior to the fusion of gametes. Gametogenesis refers to the process of formation of the haploid male and female gametes due to cell division in the parent body. The type of cell division is decided by the nature of the parent body. Haploid organisms such as moss, a type of bryophyte, 
produce gametes by undergoing mitotic division. Apart from bryophytes, other haploid organisms belonging to fungi and algae too produce gametes by mitotic division. However, diploid organisms such as pteridophytes, gymnosperms, angiosperms as well as most animals including human beings possess specialized gamete mother cells called myocytes that undergo meiosis or reduction division forming haploid gametes. These haploid gametes aren't morphologically similar and hence they are called heterogametes. Moreover, while the male gamete is called the antherozoid or sperm, the female gamete is called the egg or ovum. Most sexually reproducing organisms, including human beings, are heterogametic, which means their gametes are heterogametes. However, in the case of some algae such as Cladophora, the gametes are so strikingly similar that it is not possible to categorize them as male and female gametes. Such gametes are therefore called homogametes or isogametes. Regardless of whether they are homogametic or heterogametic, the formation of gametes is followed by gamete transfer, a process during which male gametes are brought in proximity with female gametes. In the case of algae, bryophytes and pteridophytes, water acts as a medium for such gamete transfer. Motile male gametes produced by these plants make use of water currents to reach the stationary female gamete. However, during this process, many male gametes either die or fail to reach their destination. To overcome this lacuna, most plants produce several thousand male gametes to ensure that at least some of them reach the female gamete. While water facilitates the transfer of gametes in lower plants, wind, bees and insects facilitate the transfer of gametes in higher plants including angiosperms. In these plants, the anther contains pollen grains which contain the male gametes. The female gamete, on the other hand, lies inside the ovule, a part of the ovary, which together with the style and stigma comprises the pistil. For fertilization, it is necessary for pollen grains to be deposited on the stigma so that they reach the embryo sac. This deposition occurs in different ways in different plants. In the case of monoecious plants such as the pea plant, the anther sheds the pollen grains soon after they have matured, which then fall on the stigma. In the case of dioecious plants, the transfer of pollen grains to the stigma takes place through pollination, a process in which wind, insects or bees 
deposit the pollen on the stigma. These pollen grains then germinate and produce a pollen tube that contains the male gametes. This tube penetrates the stigma and style to reach the ovule, where the male gametes are discharged. While plants depend on water and wind for gamete transfer, unisexual animals such as human beings have developed a special mechanism called copulation for gamete transfer. Thus, whether in animals or plants, gamete transfer and gametogenesis are the two main events that occur in the pre-fertilization stage of sexual reproduction. Fertilization, the second stage in sexual reproduction, is also the hallmark of the process. During this stage, the male and female gametes fuse to form a diploid zygote. Did you know that Syngamy is the other word used to describe the process of fusion of gametes or fertilization. Interestingly, fertilization does not occur in every sexually reproducing organism. In certain organisms, such as turkey, rotifers, honeybees, and even some lizards such as Nemidophorus neomexicanus, a process called parthenogenesis takes place. In this process, the female gamete does not fuse with the male gamete, but undergoes developments such as cell division or chemical changes to form new organisms. Parthenogenesis, however, occurs only in a few organisms. Fertilization, on the other hand, occurs in a wide variety of aquatic as well as terrestrial organisms. However, the way fertilization occurs in aquatic organisms is very different from the way it occurs in terrestrial organisms. In most aquatic organisms, including algae, fish and amphibians such as frogs, fertilization is external, where the male and female release their gametes in water, and the fusion of the gametes as well as the formation of the zygote occurs outside the body of the organism, that is, in an external medium such as water. During external fertilization, the gametes are released in large numbers, which translates into a large number of offspring. These offspring, however, are vulnerable to attack from various predators, including big fish, which decreases their chances of surviving till adulthood. Interestingly, frogs and other organisms, including fish that engage in external fertilization, undergo several bodily changes during the breeding season to attract mates. Take the case of the three-spined stickleback, where both the male and female sport a silvery white belly. However, during the breeding season, the belly in the male changes to bright red and in females pale yellow. However, such changes occur synchronously which ensures successful mating as well as perfect timing during the release of gametes. This enhances the chances of successful fertilization. While external fertilization is common in aquatic organisms, internal fertilization is common in terrestrial organisms including fungi, reptiles, birds, mammals 
and in a majority of plants including bryophytes, pteridophytes, gymnosperms and angiosperms. In internal fertilization, the fusion of gametes occurs inside the body of the female. While the female gamete which is formed inside the body of the female organism is stationary in nature, the male gamete is motile which makes it possible for internal fertilization to take place. Did you know that though male gametes are produced in large numbers, there is a remarkable reduction in the number of female gametes that are produced? However, not all terrestrial organisms possess a motile male gamete. In seed plants, for instance, the pollen grains present inside the anther bear non-motile male gametes. These pollen grains, therefore, depend on agents such as the wind, bees and insects to carry them to the stigma. When these pollen grains are deposited on the stigma, they germinate to form a pollen tube. This tube then travels downwards towards the ovule, where it discharges the male gamete. These male gametes unite with the female gamete to form a zygote, thus completing the fertilization process. Fertilization, thus, is an important process that ultimately results in the formation of a new life.